the show where anything goes. Motivation, mindset, recovery, philosophy, and life. We become who we are through what we experience. We all have a story, and this is my backstory with Josh Boyer. Boyer. What's up, everybody? Here we are, man, on the uh, My Backstory podcast out here in Virginia Beach with uh, Jeff Nichols. I'm super excited to be here. So uh, it, it turns out, actually, that Jeff and I know um, somebody in common. I actually grew up with, uh, with this guy. I don't need to mention his name, but we grew up together, and, um, and Jeff and him were, on, uh, were teammates, actually. So Yeah, very, very small world. Yeah, for sure. So um, I'm out here in Virginia Beach to. I want Jeff to to share his backstory. I'm a total. Uh, I'll be. I'll just be honest and candid. I'm. Uh, I'm not gonna say a fanboy, but I. I have a reverence for guys like Jeff and guys like Jeff, um, because I think their mindset and just the things that they've accomplished and things that they do are a cut above um, the majority of the population. And so I have a, a certain reverence for them. And I really want uh, Jeff to share his backstory and kind of what, you know, what he's up to now, what he's doing, what kind of like what part of his life and things through his life that he learned and that kind of helped him to be the man that he is today. Um, so I'm going to allow him to share his, his backstory with you. And so, uh, all right. Go, well, Take it away, brother. yeah, this, this, this is not scripted or, and it's, it's even, even more odd just because as we were talking off, off mic, it's, it's that walk that fine line of self promotion because that's just the professional courtesy. But at the same time, talking about yourself is very, should be very odd to someone that's genuinely not interested in hearing their own voice. Right. So I, uh, but, but that's, that's the, that's the double edged sword for me because I really, I enjoy teaching so much people. I, I, I love it. So it's like, how can you have such an introverted sort of emotional response in one regard and then the opposite on the other. And so now people are wondering, well, what, what does this have to do with anything? <laughs> <laughs> well, what it has to do with anything is the fact that there's just, I, I don't believe in a whole lot of coincidences and the backstory is probably many people are going to find it's probably similar to yours, right? It's, yeah. it is, uh, it is a path irregardless of where we come from. But if we encounter it and we don't manage it, we all end up in the same place. And that's for me and for you and for many people, uh, for many other people, it's, it's other forms of addiction or it's a handing one addiction off to take upon another, totally. right? So for me, and it, for me, it was opiate addiction was my first issue. Um, that probably stems way back to my childhood and... <clears throat> I grew up in a utopian family in, in Eastern Iowa with loving parents and a fantastic to this day, an awesome, awesome family and sister. You know, it's, it certainly isn't their doing of my own personal self-destruction. And that's not what this is about, about people feeling sorry for me because I'm so thankful that I got an opportunity to treat myself so badly. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's such a narcissistic statement in some regard because it sounds so self-deprecating but I'm truly thankful because it, it, number one, it, it brought me, first of all, brought me back to where I needed to be and have, have like a real understanding of, of what my spirituality and what God means to me. That that's like the most important thing that allowed me to kind of reformulate that in my head within context of all of those experiences over the last, my, my life since now I'm 40. So kind of fast forwarding a bit, <clears throat> through all that sort of personal choice and personal self-destruction, you, you, f you start to figure th some things out. And I used to joke at people. I said, there's a, there's a reason why there's not 75 year old heroin addicts because <laughs> they've either figured their shit out or they've died. Yeah, totally. And that's, and, and it's interesting because you, you can't, you, I, I can't seem to make that same sort of statement about alcohol and some other sort of drugs. Yeah. Right. And it, and that's the crazy thing is uh, heroin has gotten this really interesting stereotype attached to it, but that doesn't scare me as much as Percocet and Vicodin. And I mean, to be honest with you, like more than anything that scares me is 
uh, hydromorphone. Like, and I don't, that, that particular drug, it gives me like a, a, a physical visceral response of just anxiety, pure mm -hmm. anxiety. And, and it, it's certainly attached to many things that we don't need to dissect, but, and so here I am. It's a, I thought, and an interesting thing too is I thought really opiate addiction was my bottom. And, and that was one of those things that I just, once I kind of like you, we were talking, it's, I stopped using opiates pretty much cold Turkey after I had basically, <laughs> there is a big chunk of time that elapsed. Yeah. where I had donned body armor and began staging weapons and firearms into my truck that was doors were open. Uh, keys were in it. I can't remember if it was on or not. It's just, it, it's kind of hazy. Sometimes I feel like it was on some, but this is some years ago and I, I get to that point, you know, that's, that's where I was at. I was in a really a place where there was nothing good coming out of that addiction. And so and I, and I didn't want to play with my son at the time. And so with that, that, and my son, I was able to quit opiates really cold Turkey. I've, I've had Percocet once since then. And it nearly just, it made me so sick at dinner that it's like almost just thinking about it again, it gives me that visceral response. So going through opiate addiction, I thought, Hey, that, that was, that was my demon. And I got rid of that demon and I just exchanged that addiction for sex, yeah. you know? And or power, right? And it wasn't just sex. Sex was a component of power in my mind and uh, dominance and in, in other males, not, not physical dominance, but just emotional, just crudeness, I guess. Mm -hmm. So that, that for me was way worse than the opiates. That was an, that was something I couldn't turn off. Yeah. You know, the, the opiates and the stress coincided where I could turn those issues off for that period of time and get blocks of, not levity, but relief. Yeah. But when you're dealing with, with emotional stuff as deep for me as disrespecting and neglecting the love of other people that truly care about you, like that for me was, was, was the most difficult thing for me to overcome. Oh, yeah. And that's then it led to my, my suicide behavior um, and my decision to do that. So, and then now fast forward again, a couple of years, I'm to the point now where the story as I tell it seems so incredibly unfamiliar to the person that I'm telling it about, you know, <laughs> so I get, I get it completely, man. It's so that, that's why that really I think it stumps people. And he probably does with you is people get stumped at people. Or people tend to look as though, as though they've been stumped when they hear me or you or someone speak. So as a matter of factly about these excruciatingly traumatic moments we put ourselves through yep. and we're able to disassociate that emotion so well now it see it sounds like we're lying right like we didn't go through that and to me that just means that we did it right <laughs> oh, yeah absolutely i think that that's part of the deal you mentioned it earlier about you're you're almost like fortunate that you went through that because i think now it gives you the ability to be a better teacher and um and it does. I mean, even telling my story is kind of, it feels like it's like, I'm not fabricating it. I'm telling the real deal yeah. story. And, but it seems like from where I stand now, it seems so far fetched. Like what? I was that far in addiction. Like I was that. Because you still kind of outwardly look right. Because look at, we phys look I, I, again. I don't, here's the interesting thing is like, you and I really don't know each other. Right. Uh, beyond the short conversations that we've had, it's, but I'm, but you're a walking billboard that has created a stereotype that you are who you are and you're proud of you, but that inside doesn't seem to emotionally match with how other people perceive you physically right. or previously emotionally. And that, that's, that's the weird thing of it all. Cause you're that here. I think this is what throws addicts off so much is that they, they, a lot of addicts truly have this point of, of uh, they leap for faith. They successfully begin that journey of, uh, I guess, rejuvenation and uh, rebuilding hope. Yeah. But the people that were closest to them, they've either found out that they're not true friends or even true friends that you and I have no experience. I had some true friends that I, I was so disgusting to for so, for long enough. They finally were like, 
enough is enough and that's it. And that I deserve that too. So that's the interesting thing is I think that a lot of addicts, that's, that's the leaping point. Like that's the breaking point for many. Like I'm better. Look at me. I'm better. And you actually are. But then you look around for some security and some comfort and there's no one to be seen. Right. And so I think that that's the point where a lot of addicts go, well, fuck it then. Nobody does love me. I was right. What's the point of all this? And, and, and when I got to that crossroads, I had, I had three or four people right there. And I'm like, I didn't expect those people to be there at the end of this. Cause I was, I, I had secluded myself into my house for a better part of eight months. Yeah. And, uh, it was, uh, it, man, it hit me the other day. It's, it's been, it's been almost three years since I began this sort of didn't begin. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's that point of like fall out, steep climb out. I, I don't feel like I'm so tired anymore. I've got it figured out a little bit. Yeah, totally. But sometimes you got to go through that shit to get there. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's part of the deal. I think like personally where I stand, like I feel like mentally and physically, like I'm stronger than I've ever been. You know, even like when I was younger, it's like, oh, when you're younger, you're you know stronger, more vital. It's like not nah, bullshit. Like I was in. I'm not buying that at all. No, not. I'm really not anymore. And that's, no. I, and so that I that that's a kind of where I, I had to anchor all of these beliefs into into something. Right. And for me, with my background as an exercise physiologist, and that's the interesting thing is, like I said, I, I've been abusing my body for so long. It was it was it was so ignorant to me. That I re- when I realized that I, I was even fool, I was like I was even fooling myself, or I thought I was. Like the, a person that is my profession is to take care of the human body and its tissue, yeah. and I wasn't even doing that for myself. And so now that's kind of how it all started. A couple of years ago, I just I was in a lot of pain, but I didn't have a lot of acute, uh, severe trauma like. I hadn't had a history of a lot of broken bones and torn ligaments. I mean, I, it's like I have a rabbit's foot shoved up my butt because I've had so many close calls and I've had, I've been in so many traumatic accidents where I felt like I should have gotten way worse hurt right. other than like my concussions and my head trauma, which is, I, again, it's, it's all relative, but now trying to get, get everything in order, it, it didn't make sense standing from my starting with my brain. So getting my body back in order was one of those things that I actually had to rediscover finding joy in training again. I trained every single day for years and decades now almost. Right. Okay. But I, but there it's been, I started thinking, I was like, when's the last time you trained just because you really liked it. And then when I, that's again, that's, that's kind of the journey I'm on right now is that, I probably will all always have a tendency to try to exchange one vice or one addiction to another until I really am able to temper addiction. And I feel like finally at 40 years old, I have enough clear headedness to fight addiction with the help of certain things, yeah. you know, and, and, and friendship is one of those things that's, is, building real relationships and building friendships of people. Not only you care about, and it's this is how I always know I care about somebody is when 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 you are happy for their success, no matter how big or small, that for me is how I really look at somebody. And it and it's not it's not a way of me measuring someone's value. It's how I measure my closeness to them emotionally. Right. And then I go, man, I I really have a big heart for this person, or a bigger, or like, or like you're deeply afflicted. Yeah. And so that's, that's, that's how I measure things now. I just try to measure them from different lenses that before I never would have thought to look through. Right. I found that when I was, uh, when, I, when I got clean and I wasn't all jacked up, and I think you mentioned it earlier about you come out of that and you start to realize that who are the real people in your life? Who are the people that were, I mean, when I was all jacked up, it's like I had all kinds of people in my world. And the mutual friend that we know, actually, he was the one that told me when I was going through my divorce, he said, hey, man, you need to trim the fat in your life. And he was 110% right. I had so many people in my life that were just acquaintances. They weren't people that they were pulling like, energy. Yeah, they were, they were energy suckers. They weren't like doing anything positive for me. It wasn't, they were kind of like, um, I guess, uh, 
keeping me kind of in that addiction. They weren't pr- like helping me to realize my own bullshit. I had a bunch of yes yeah. people around me and it wasn't, I, I was always the, the type A or the alpha male in most of the groups that I was in. And so nobody was really checking me and being like, dude, what are you doing? Yeah. What the fuck are you doing? You know? Yeah. And uh, so I stayed in this state. And then it, when I, when I got divorced is really when I woke up and was like, wow, I yeah. really need to get my life together. And that's why I was like, well, I mean, there's so many different avenues that you can go, so many different uh, ways that you can go for getting clean or whatever. And I'm not knocking any of them. I think they're all, they all have their beauty. They all have their things that, that help certain people. And that's good. But for me, it was all or nothing. Yeah. And I needed to be done. And I right. knew that. So I just had to quit and be done. And, but when I did quit, I noticed that a lot of those quote unquote friends that I thought I had, those weren't friends at all. And it wasn't so much that I was, I wasn't angry or resentful. It was more like, this just doesn't serve me anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and that's it. I, I, th- I think that, well, th- this, is, this is just to lay grounds for how I establish my train of thought in its complexity. Because I, I used to be very acutely like, say, that's the problem. Right. Well, if I look at why are we in this systematic what seems to be a very systematic sort of slowly just the, the 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 american or the world like western culture of like hard work and responsibility that that sort of forgive the ridiculous vernacular that that old american gusto or whatever you want to call it that we used to have yeah. not that we don't have it at all like it's just we've we've Based off of our own intellect, we've just kind of softened the world a little bit too much. Totally. It's it, we want these luxuries. Don't be wrong. Like I, I want the vehicle I own because of many of the amenities and luxuries that it provides me. But I also want to get out there and seek something that's challenging, whatever that means. Mm-hmm. And, and and for me, that's wrapped into one word: creativity. Yeah. Because if some, if you're being creative. That 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 basically is the basket that can hold hold anything you enjoy. Yeah. It could be physical, it could be emotional creativity, it could be music, it could be drawing, it could be all of them. Like I love, I've just found a love again for playing the guitar. At the same time with drawing again, at the same time with loving music again, and it, it it's, it, but it, what it's done is it's given me variety. So the long long with the short for me is that. I think that any state that we take on happy, sad, angry, glad, no matter what state that we're in, the the refuge that people tend to find is, is creativity that allows you to be angry. It's like, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to put my angry music on. That's a form of creativity. Yeah. But I think if we, I think what we're doing is lacking the recognition of it and saying, Oh, you're just depressed. You're this It's like, yeah. But instead of saying, Let's let's look at the big depressed elephant in the room. Let's say, hey, let's let's plug yourself into creativity. What did you used to do as a kid? And I go, like I said this morning, when I was a kid, <laughs> I used to I I grew up in the country and I used to go into the country, into the woods and climb trees and to be a kid. Well, this morning I just got a hair in my ass and I happened to live on a wooded acre and I was like, man, I want to go go in the woods. So I did. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Because I wanted to, right? <laughs> because it's, it's like what a kid would do. Be creative, man. Sun's out. It's beautiful out here. Yeah. I didn't uh, I never really thought of it that way because I, I found that like, I always find that my refuge is in the mountains, you know, like, yeah. and I hike and I get after it. I never saw it as creativity, but I think you're hundred percent right. It's kind of like where it's me against myself. I'm not, I'm usually most of the time by myself hiking and it's like, um, I'm in my own head. Yeah. And I, I tell you what, man, some of my best thoughts some of my best thinking happens on those mountains when i'm out there right grinding someone said i was uh, well mitch aggie and uh, mitch aguiar and i uh were on the beach a couple couple months ago uh here in virginia beach and i started we were talking and i said i just had this thought i was like you know there's all there's a bunch of people on the beach him and a bunch of us we were on the beach running and doing some just training and just having like it was a good like saturday afternoon or something or late morning but anyways I just had this thought and I was like, there's all these people on the beach, but yet I, and it's beautiful. Yeah. And I just, I, I did not feel connected. I felt, I still felt a little bit alone. And I always thought like being in the mountains, 
I never felt lonely. I never felt alone. Like, and there's, don't get me wrong. There's tons of wildlife, obviously in the ocean and the beach and whatnot. But I feel like in the mountains, it's like, it, it like animals, they'll seek refuge under shelter, under canopy. Right. You don't find many animals that are going to seek refuge on a beach. Right. You know, so I kind yeah. of felt like, exp I feel exposed. Yeah. I don't feel exposed in the mountains as much as I do in the beach. And so for me, I feel the same way. Yeah, that's a great, great way of looking at it, you know, because I was actually uh, telling my wife this the other day that uh, I had this fear of being alone. I had this fear of like being lonely. And for me lately, my biggest thing, I guess, has been exposing myself to the shit I fear the most. Like, what is it that I fear? And now I'm going to, I'm going to face it head on. And that was part of getting clean. That was part of, you know, me not drinking anymore. Part of that was you got to face your shit head on. You can't lubricate yourself anymore. Yeah. And, um, be in the mountains is the same thing. I never felt alone in the mountains, even though I was by myself, there was so much around me that I, I but didn't feel alone at all. You, you could be in the mountains. Yeah. You could plant your feet. Yeah. Okay. You just here, bear with me here. Plant your fountain, plant your feet in the mountains where you have full view of a mountain range. Yep. It doesn't have to be robust. It doesn't have to be even majestic. Plant your feet, face one direction. You can, you can move your eyeballs for 24 hours only. If nothing else moved, you would, you could spend that entire 24 hours and still have not seen the entire landscape in front of you. Right. You can't do that with the ocean. I mean, mm -hmm. in, in some ways, yes, you can, cause it's always moving and so forth. And it, but I'm just talking about objects that are not necessarily in motion that need to be surveyed by the human eye. Right. That for me is it. It's the math. It's like the flickering of the fire of infinites. Yep. Infinite. It's like an infinite math equation coming up from nothingness, right? Yeah. That's what I see trees and mountains as because it's always changing because things are falling and dying and blowing and moving. It's a landscape that never stops. Yep. And for me, that, that infinity speaks to humility. Yeah. I like that. Dude, the same analogy I've heard is made about sand. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's a trip because I, you know, when I would go out there, I was a lot of times I would go when I got, when I got off all of my, you know, my stuff or whatever, I, uh, that was my refuge. I would go to the mountains, I would hike. Right. And, um, sometimes I wouldn't bring even a knife with me. I would just go by myself. And I was like surrendering to the fact that nature doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> I mean, like there could be a mountain lion right around the corner. There could be a bear. There could be a lot of different things and whatever. But I, it's going to sound all airy fairy, but whatever. Um, I felt like when I was in a good headspace, when I was like, if it's called it call oneness, whatever, when I just felt like I was in a really good space, I felt untouchable. I felt like nothing can bother me right now. Nothing, nothing is going to harm me because why would they? I mean, like I'm vibrating to a, a certain frequency where I'm good yep. to go. And I don't know if that makes any sense even saying it to people that are listening, but to me, it makes perfect sense internally where it's like, I, I get what I'm saying. You know, it's just hard no, to articulate. It sense. It, you know, and, and that's that's what I was saying to that that perfect pitch and fall of life. Yeah. And and that's I guess the backstory of this is that you and I are our backstories are simultaneously linked with other people with very similar backstories. Right. And what 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 you're starting to see, or okay, what I'm starting to see is a bunch of 30 to 40 to like 30 30 to 44 year old men that not just from the veteran population but just just life like this is the last the last 25 30 years has been a really great time to be on this planet like oh yeah so good well for many all again I'm not overlooking tragedy I'm looking from a objective point of view of evolution of technology of of, of uh, ability to preserve human life. I'm, I'm not I'm not talking about just industry and shit. I'm talking the magnificence of human intellect manifested into technology and ways to preserve and love and care for people and the planet. Okay, we'll just say it that hoofy poofy way. Okay, right. Um. There are a lot of people in that time frame because of that amazing time period that are looking for real purpose, like deep 
deep rooted purpose because so many people in our generation have achieved quote unquote, so much of what society says, if you achieve this, you will feel fulfilled. Right. Right. And and then that's the thing is I'm saying this not to put ownership on or responsibility on like, for example, my time in the Navy, the United States Navy was not responsible for my happiness or they, they, they were employer. And I respect that. It's just that it's so interesting because I was walking in my house yesterday and I was like, man, what, why is it that like, I have so many Amazon boxes and I'm like, cause I saw my bill and I was like, Oh, cause I'm still after all this time, after all this time. And then out of the Navy, I've been, I was, uh, in special spec war for about 11 years. And so I've been out for five and, uh, in that 11 years, the abundance, like, Oh, if I needed batteries, there's at any given time, a drawer full of batteries or duct tape or like, Oh, I need more socks. Oh, just go to supply and get, 50 pair of socks. Like I'm so still programmed of buying shit. I don't need sometimes, Right. you know, that abundance yeah. that, and so for me, that's what I'm really trying to temper is I've lived in such abundance for so long that it was really hard for me to get off. And that's the addiction. That's what I mean. It's like, I, I see these little addictions manifest, manifest themselves all throughout my life. Oh yeah. And it's like, okay, I've solved the opiate thing. Oh, that's never coming back because that scares the pants off me. Yeah. Okay. I've solved the infidelity thing because that was the one thing that nearly, that's how, that was the nugget where I began to plan killing myself. And I decided that was my way out. Mm-hmm. Came to terms with that. That's not coming back because now that sort of just, it, it's an emotional chuckle when I think about infidelity being a real threat now. And so then I and then I have other things in my life and I go, oh, this is this is the next step. This this is the next step that I have to take because I have to uncover these stones because I'll I'll fall in a trap again to other sort of vices. I'll buy shit I don't need, right? right? I'll travel. I'll I'll get like I'll I'll quench my my addiction by going fuck it. I'm gonna go travel here and go buy something I don't need and go buy a car like. That's the addiction I'm in right now. It's like, okay, I got to temper my spending. Yeah, It's strange. It just, and I don't know what's next yeah. because I've never, what's coming next might become very obvious because I may have been in this cycle before, yeah. but I've never been aware of it. Right. And so I'm like, all right, get a handle on my spending because it's interesting because I know the infidelity is not going to come back. The lying is not going to come back and the opiate addiction is not going to come back. So I'm like, all right. These things really, these issues are still important, but I'm handling them now. Finally, right. they're not, I'm actually dealing with them and not going, Oh, they'll deal with itself with time. No, man, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta look that sucker dead in the eye. Definitely, man. It's funny because like the more you're talking, the more stuff's coming up for me. You know, where I'm thinking like, wow, it's crazy. You know? Cause I, I think a lot of people are getting to that point in their life where they look at everything they have or they've acquired. And it's like, do I really need this shit? You know, like I look at the house I live in and yeah, it's a beautiful house. It's, it's all good. Um, but there's a lot of shit around me that I don't really need. Yeah. I just, and what did I have that for? So then you start like going deep with that. I mean, like, was that to please myself or was that to please other, make other people think a certain thing of me? Was I trying to portray a certain image that people would, oh, this guy's so great. He has this, this big house with these, you know, nice plantation shutters. Who gives a shit? You know what I mean? Like, does that really matter? You know? Right. And that's kind of where, um, I never thought of it as an addiction or as part of my addiction, but I think you're absolutely right, man. Because I was doing the same shit. Like I'll buy just random useless shit for what? Because like, think oh, about this anymore, but I spend like a freaking fiend, you know, on, on certain things that are just irrelevant, you know? Addictions don't start with high quantity. Right. Yeah, it's true. And that, and that's a really hard thing that people would realize ago because now Many, many things that get introduced into your life at minimal quantity don't create a negative impact. And even in a perfect example is for many people, food doesn't become a detrimental, impactful thing, right? right? So that being said, we, we, we've kind of been conditioned. The human body has, because of its resiliency, has kind of conditioned us to think, well, these pain pills 
I've, I have a history of resiliency of fighting off. Like I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not these sort of things. That's me. It's like, I've never tasted, I've, I've tasted alcohol, uh, two weddings and, uh, two days over Thanksgiving break a couple years ago as a first drink. So I've never been drunk. I've never been, I may, I'd say a familiarity potentially with what you would consider like a, oh, a friendly buzz, a couple drinks. Right. But, uh, uh, so my point is, is my only reference for addiction was opiates. So, and I go, oh my God, some of my behavior, my irrational, spontaneous, compulsive behavior associated with a physical thing yeah. that elicits an emotional response. Right. Buying is a, I can see it's like food and buying. And now I see it's like now, but the problem is, is that I think addiction is a behavior issue, but we attribute it to a, a an item issue. It's alcohol's problem. No, it's not Budweiser's problem. <laughs> it's the person's problem. Yep. It's not McDonald's fault. It's the person's lack of control. I, I, forgive McDonald's and I, I, the vernacular. I, I, I'm not a I'm not an anti McDonald's person in the slightest. Right. I'm a I'm a I'm a control person. I you know what the you know my favorite food? Like I grew up snowboarding, love to snowboard. Moving my move my ass to Colorado so I go snowboarding again <laughs> here in a couple months. My favorite thing to eat coming off of a mountain is McDonald's cheeseburgers and fries. And it makes perfect sense. Fat, salt, sugar. Yeah, replenishing everything you just expelled. Yeah, totally. In a high altitude environment. And it's like, no wonder why my body starved and tons of water and caffeine at once. Okay. Yeah. So it's like, oh, I don't don't get me wrong. I'm gonna I'm gonna entertain that addiction because if I don't, it'll get me. Not I mean say like, oh, I'm gonna give into it. It's like I recognize what it is. It's an impulsive behavior that I know I can control. Right. It's a trip, man. Because I if you look at it that way, like where it's like it's a it's all a mental game. Everything that everything you have going on around you, right, is like what are you controlling? What are you not controlling? What are you what are you losing sight of? And if you don't stay aware of it, next thing you know, like you said, it doesn't start where you're just you know taking you know copious amounts of of opiates. No, it starts small. It right, it does. It does. Yeah. And then you look at yourself and you're like, oh wow. Or like for me, I'll look at my bank account and be like, oh shit. Because yep. I think <laughs> because I because here's the, here's probably the the uh, the pharmacology fact is that I remember the first time I ever took uh, opiate. Uh, an opi opioid, you know, I was uh, a senior in college and uh, I was prescribed Lortabs. I had really bad uh, uh, strep throat and just hard. I, my throat just hurt so bad. They're like, hey, if you could chew these up and get them choked down, you'll be able to eat. And I was like, oh, that's pretty awesome. What kind of drug is this? What kind of magic pill is this? Right. I took one. It was a 500 milligram. So it was like a, a, a 10 or was a, a 10, 325, right? Right something sort of thing. And uh, I remember sitting on the couch, my two roommates were, for, were from Toronto and uh, super good dudes, man. And I remember sitting on this couch in our furnished apartment and I was like, I was watching Seinfeld. <laughs> and I remember to the left, over my left shoulder, my roommate and good friend Al Stevens was there. And I was like, he looks up at me and he goes, he always say, he'd call me buddy. Right. He's like, uh, he's like, hey, buddy, what's up? And I was like, I looked at him. He goes, dude, are you okay? And I go, Al, am I floating? <laughs> and he goes, he just started, he just, I, he had a peanut butter, he had a piece of bread with peanut butter either on the bread or on the knife. And I remember he like, it dropped. He dropped himself to the floor in total laughter. Cause you know, he had experimented as in high school with marijuana and some things. And, and, and for me, that was so foreign. This, this idea of euphoria, right. It scared me. I, I didn't take the rest of the bottle. <laughs> scared the pants off of me i remember giving them away i sold the bottle for like 40 bucks to a friend thinking what who the fuck wants these yeah. these are terrible <laughs> this is terrifying <laughs> you know <laughs> so, funny. so fast forward to 2000 and shoot 2007 and uh in afghanistan and i hurt my back i got a nice gnarly little back strain and mr tramadol gets introduced to me oh yeah Oh, the T train. Yeah. Fuck it all is what I used to, I just, oh, that's what we used to call it, man. And it was, that's, that was, that was the one drug that I felt. That's the one drug that 
I would continue to convince myself that I'm not an addict. Oh yeah. It's like, oh no, this is, you know, this is pharmaceutical, like it's synthetic, it's not real opioids. It's I'm feeling it, but it's not really it it, it was it's the bullshitter drug. It's a total joke. It's like yeah. this isn't an opiate. The fuck it's not. Yeah. It's worse. And yeah, it's crazy that we make excuses for ourselves. Like, yeah. We find any way to like justify like our behavior. Any, any way that we can, like most people will try and justify so it. So ego ridden, so, man. Yeah, it's like, hey, you know, I'm uh, talking about McDonald's. It's like people going to McDonald's. It's like, well, you know, I'm just going to McDonald's because this, that, or the other thing. It's like, okay, if, if you want to go to McDonald's, go to McDonald's. I mean, it's all good, you know, but when you start to see it's a problem where like your cholesterol's through the roof and your triglycerides yep. are, you know, through the roof, it's like maybe you need to start like looking at some things, you know, like if you're taking all kinds of like pharmaceuticals to try yeah. and counteract some of these bad, poor life yeah. choices. And, and that's the thing yeah. is like, no one should be advocating elimination of McDonald's. Right. Yeah. No one. And here, here. Okay. I can't believe I'm going to say this. I'm not even advocating. You should get rid of, you should make smoking tobacco illegal as far as within the confines of whatever someone wants to do in their home or their property. Like I, I don't give a damn if somebody wants to shoot heroin in their backyard necessarily. Now, do I think that's a good thing for a civil population to completely? Hell no. I'm not advocating no restriction at all of any of these sort of things. What I'm advocating is what's happening, it seems. Very good, level-headed, long-form communication amongst many groups, not just the left or the right or the whatever. It seems to me, you know, for podcast in its popularity is starting to become something as a trusted way to deliver information. Uh, it's becoming a trusted place to defend yeah. oneself ethically, kind of, you know, it, it's not a, I, I don't think it's ever going to be a good platform for, you know, two people to, that will never agree to, yeah. to probably sort stuff out. But I, I think people, it's my belief that people want to hear people say these moderate, moderate things because yeah. they go, I feel moderate. I don't feel light, way left. I don't feel way right. Is that weird? My coworkers are all yelling at each other and they hate each other and they don't talk in the break room and it's racist. And I'm like, I, I don't believe in any of your bullshit. Yeah. So, hey, let's go grab a fucking pizza, man. And let's go smoke some marijuana. We're done chill the fuck out together totally you know what i mean like that's and then at the same time my whole day my whole day from the time i woke up to the time the sun goes down i've been busting my ass i've been working my business i've been making making new new connections ethically I, I, it's like i'm not advocating being a stoner either right i'm advocating being a responsible adult and where in this timeline that we're talking about, I've had such an amazing, unique, vast experience, sort of, uh, you know, variety of experiences that so many people in our age group, men and women have had in the last 20 years. Like there's so much information to be shared. Definitely. So and a lot of people like, I think I got the other issue though, is that there's a lot of, um, like we talked about it earlier, that society or your parents or religion or whatever it is your program that you grew up with there's so many things that are, is coming into my awareness even that i never ever would have talked about i never would have thought about and i think podcasting for me gives me the form and the platform i guess to to just share my story freely and to hear other people's story freely and be like hey yeah man like if uh you know whether it be marijuana whether it be ayahuasca whether it be things that like most people oh dude you can't talk about that you know yeah yeah you know, like, that's not that's not cool um, let go of it, man. And be like, Hey, if it serves you, if it's a, if it's for a greater good and you're a responsible human being and you're, you're promoting the betterment of humankind, you know, then why is it bad, man? What makes right. it bad? I don't get right. it. You know? And I, and, and I think that, uh, you know, it's it, having, having this sort of discussion or argument, you know, not you and I argument, but I, I don't, I don't consider argument is a, a negative thing. It's yeah. just like when I say, if, if I like, on one of a recent posts where, you know, if I'm, if I'm saying, Hey, people have accused me, for example, of lying about something, for example, yeah. okay. 
I'm not saying that because I'm angry, uh, because the haters or the whatever people want to say it. Like it's like, no, no, no. I'm just, I, I'm I'm putting myself out there so the people that do care what I have to say goes, okay, it's just for the validation. Like yeah, he's he's being honest with me because the 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 more the more honest that I found myself to be, it's a weird thing because then I found I find myself being a little bit even more emotionally upset when I'm accused of not being truthful. I'm, I'm just talking about big or little stuff. I'm not talking about even like an acute event. Right. I'm just thinking practice. Yeah. That's what it is. And and for no, no matter what it is, being a better person, cleaning up your life, changing the way you eat, it just comes out with small practice, starts with small practice. Right. And then it gets to a point that like you said, like when someone, when someone questions that integrity or someone questions that, you feel like they need to validate it and be like, no, no, let me, let me share with you that I'm, I am truthful. And that's kind of one of the things that actually one of the guys I met with in Iowa, you know, like uh, when I was doing the podcast with him, that's one of the things he, the takeaways that I took from that conversation with him was that just be honest, man, and own your shit. And don't, don't be afraid of what the, what people are going to say, like own. And for me, that's freedom yeah. to be able to just get all of my skeletons out. I don't know. Some people are like, oh, you know, you keep certain things close to your chest. You don't let everybody know everything about you. For, I disagree with that though. For me, like, what do I have to hide? I have nothing to hide. You know, there's certain things I might want to keep personal about my kids and things yeah. like that that I don't need to share and that's all good. But the majority of my life is an open book. And if anybody wants to question my integrity and my honor, like, here, here I am. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and I will feel the need because I am being honest and candid. I would feel the need to, to um, if someone were, a hater came out and said, oh, well, this isn't true. That isn't true. Well, now I'm going to prove you that it is true because I'm not lying to you. Yeah. So and, I, and I think that, it. and also too, it's like having, I, I have, I don't have the guilt. I have the freedom now to, there are certainly things I've said in my past that were either exaggerated or just not true. Right. Right. Whether it be in a public forum or just in a private friendly forum where you, you know, not not creating excuse just backstory it's like you you're trying to be something you're not or you're trying to you get in an argument and you're 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 inflammatory or uh or whatever it may be absolutely that that's i think that that's one of the things that i'll probably struggle with forever which is why practicing precise speech for me is the best way for me to combat that because it's it slows me way down yeah. And I'm much less apt to just fire off and be emotional and go, that's not true. My fish was this big. Right. So for me, like that, and that's, that's kind of what it all comes down to is, you know, the creativity piece was, you know, you can practice that so much and it, to get in that headspace. But what I really needed to do is practice just being nice, just being casually friendly. Like, and what I found out is like, as I'm practicing being nice, it's it's like I'm rigid. It's yep. like learning to swim. Like you're like a refrigerator with arms and you realize it's, it doesn't make sense. What do you mean relax and kick? I can't do both. Right. Then you learn to relax and kick, right? right? And then the water's like, oh, this thing actually helps me float. It's, it's it, you know, I, it doesn't mean I just can float here and lay. I got to work. Right. Like that's for me is relationships like swimming. You just got to keep moving. Totally. Okay. But, but the better you become at moving, the better you become at swimming, the better you become at relationships. And then all of a sudden you see a swimmer and you go, that guy swims, but that person's been swimming their whole life and you can just see it. And that's joy. That's for me is when someone's been practicing being good to somebody. And then it's that person you meet. Like I mentioned, George Ryan yeah. uh, in Los Angeles, he, you just meet him and you're like, I just feel like I want to get a hug by that dude. He just, <laughs> he just exudes joy. Yeah. He in- exudes intelligence. He exudes patience, kindness, sincerity, but he exudes authority. Right. And to me, I'm like, how does it do that, that that's that well put together and articulate and soft spoken? Just you just like, man, I don't want to tussle with that guy, yeah. especially because of his brain. It's like he's just gonna make you feel like a fool. Yeah. And so those are the sort of people I that's the backstory. It's like I'm looking at other people with similar backstories going. I want to see how they overcame it because now I'm trying to create this Rolodex of personal information and networks that I, when I encounter somebody that's struggling, 
I go, this is the guy, this is the woman, this is the place, this is the person. This is who you need to go see because they are on a similar path. And I was able to pull 3% from this person. You might be able to pull 5, 10, 15% of their journey. Yeah. Use it your own. And then as you go through that journey, you're going to run into other similar people that have gotten to that same fork. And then you go, and you're more trusting. So now you're willing to be more, be more risk-taking, but not at the risk of making the same mistakes because you've made them. Right. And then it's the next step. And then it's, you're never stagnant. You're never going, what am I doing? You're going, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Be productive, have creativity, find joy, find love. Right. It's so crazy because I'd never, like, as you're talking, like the things that you're saying, I'm like, wow, maybe I've been doing those things. I just didn't realize that that's what I was doing. You know what I mean? Like trying to connect certain people, you know, and having a Rolodex of people to be like, Hey, go talk to that person. Go talk to this person. Like that's been my like dream is to be able to have that much I don't know if the world's influence, but have that much like um, networking. My network is that big where like I know certain people in every category of life. Where yep. like if you, if you need this or that or whatever, I know who to send you to. And uh, my wife used to tell me that all the time, you know, like whenever we like stuff around the house, you know, I need something done on the house or whatever. She's like, you know somebody for everything. How do you know all these people? It's like, because I make it a point to talk to people, you know, like and get and hear their story. And, yeah. and I, I make a connection with the janitor, you know, next thing I know the janitor knows a painter. He knows this person or that person. It's like, you're just making all these random connections with people. And uh, it's funny because like, did you know the journey that you're on now? Did you realize that you were on that journey even when you were in it like 10 years ago that you're like on this path to, to be where you are right now? Or is it kind of like connecting the dots backward and being like, oh, wow, that makes sense now. I will say that I have, this is obviously not to the day, but in my current state, my appreciation for being able to live in the moment has only been for a couple months, like really like living in the moment. It's something I've, I wouldn't say I've attained, yeah. but it's something I'm aware of finally. <clears throat> so what does that mean? And like the answer is like, I, I'm, I'm cons, I'm guilty of it's getting stuck in my head. And when I do that, I begin to construct a resolution rather than let it res let it play out based off of, I know in this moment I've made the right decisions. Yeah. And so now that's not to say that I don't look ahead and, you know, plan trips and vacations or, uh, you know, book things in advance, but specifically you kind of mentioned it in terms of meeting people and talking to people, I think if you authentically meet somebody and you give them a minute and you talk to them and you go, Oh, that was a pleasant conversation. And it was interesting. And it was, it was what it was. That person may come back in life, but I think, you know, in context to me is I, I would meet, you know, fortunately I've been able to meet some extremely interesting people in my profession, in the sports yeah. world and performance world. And I, and I've forced the issue a bit yeah. instead of trying to build a relationship first, not not in order to find work, but in order just to respect, respect the time that they've given me. And so since I've been able to do that, to go, hey, I, I've, I am privileged to get an opportunity to go be a fly in the wall for this organization or this team or this person or this, this company. And that's what I'm there to be. I'm there to be a white belt. I'm there to make sure I live in the moment and don't miss the opportunity and then try to <laughs> try to be the center of attention. Yeah. Like the alpha we talked about. Yeah, for sure. So you think that's always been your thing? Have you always been like the alpha in your group? Like when you were growing up, I mean, we talked about it, you know, a little bit before the podcast. Did you know, I mean, you were a smaller guy growing up, you know, and then you, you know, started, you know, jacking some weights and this and that. At what point did you realize like, I'm going to be doing something bigger and greater. I'm going to get into the fitness world. I'm going to, you know, or whatever. Yeah. I'm going to join the Navy. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I was never, <laughs> never like lifting weights and doing all those sort of things as this r real form of motivation. And so I mean, it was, it was motivating, but it was like, definitely it was compensation at the end of the day is what it was. And yeah. You know, I, I was never determined. Like I, I, it was never in my head that I was going to do these things. I had a big chip on my shoulder 
And I did a lot of those things to prove a point, to make an example of, of these imaginary and sometimes real naysayers. Yeah. It, it, but I, but I, I held on to them emotionally. I took them very personally. I, I, I made myself take them personally. Yeah. It, it, it certainly drove me. I, I could say that anger was definitely a fuel that I utilized readily, effectively, but it finally burnt me. You know, it, it was, uh, but I wasn't destined to be on this path. Like I didn't think that I would be, you know, I, I'm not, I don't consider myself a success anyway. I just consider myself taking a unique opportunity and a unique path that now that, now that I've gone through it, it's given me perspective to become a better teacher because I still have affinity for that profession in the Navy that I did and I respect it. But I, I don't I don't deserve and nor do I think that I have any sort of, uh, uh, I guess, entrance to that. Like, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to get in, involved in the community. I just feel like, man, given my experiences, I, I think I could help these guys, not just in the physical attributes, but just understand that, hey, if we move better, we treat ourselves better, we, we can do that job better and more violently than we think we ever could. It's right. not just an objective behavior. What do you think when you were going through buds and you went through a, a development group a selection? What um, what do you think the common thread is amongst operators as far as mindset? Because I mean, you talked about like the the naysayers and this like that. That was your drive or part of your drive. And I'd say like for me, like maybe there was some of that for me, like trying to prove people like wrong yeah. that I wasn't just going to be a product of my environment. Like I came from a broken home and. I was a loose cannon and like whatever. So I needed to prove something to people, you know, whether it be in my career or my life. Um, a lot of that for me was like proving to my dad because he wasn't around, you know, it was like proving yep. to him that like, this is what you're missing, you know? Uh -huh. So I, I had that chip on my shoulder to be like, I'm going to be as successful as I possibly can right. just to show you type thing. And then, you know, obviously you're not aware of it while you're in it until you start, you know, taking a step back and become the observer. Um, so what would you say is a common thread with, because that, those guys, I mean, you guys are a cut above. You know? Yeah. It's not, that's not the norm. No, I, I, th I, I, you know, I, the mindset isn't the norm. The, the, the reality, and that's, that's what I'm saying is it's, and this, it goes back to creativity. Right. It really does. Because there, there is a, I think from a mathematical perspective, there are a, a group of individuals that have a higher IQ yeah. than your average population. Uh, athletic or otherwise population. Uh, their physical size is above average in some of those attributes. I think it, I think it is. It's everyone's unique, it, everyone's unique backstory. It's, I look at it like this. It's to any single point on a map coming from different locations, you all can end up in that same point in the map, just different routes. Definitely. And that forging process is something that, you know, has been talked about extensively internally and externally, the community probably and for, forever will be of what is the matrix that makes up or embodies the perfect person so we can pre-select. Right. Well, I think that it's, it is those things that from a physical standpoint, that's not the question. We can physically prepare the human body very easily to endure that. That's not the question, right? Because if that's the question, if that's the question, uh, you'd be able to fulfill those physical quotas in any branch or military or law enforcement community yeah. and, and any sporting community for that matter. So long of the short is creativity. Uh, they're the most creative individuals because what, what, what that community does each little kind of job within inside the job within inside the job continues to demand the highest level of not only expertise, because of safety in many cases, again, we're talking explosions and skydiving. That's why I mean expertise. I'm not just yeah. talking like these guys are experts. No. So like the jobs within the military, within the jobs like care, a SEAL. Okay. Within that job, you have to be a proficient, if not an expert diver, proficient, if not expert skydiver and so on. Right. So you have to take on these jobs that not only demands expertise, but making the critical decisions under duress. That is a form that's developed under creativity, which is why you do simunition. You do these fake, these runs and because it's, it builds on play, right? It builds on the intellect of repetition and 
positive and negative feedback with instruments that look and feel and smell and taste the same way the real ones do. It's just the consequences sometimes are much less. It, it's 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 a stress inoculation is what we're talking here. So that's that's for from my standpoint is my whole goal for for my life and for the people that I'm able to impact is I want them to understand that what we want to do in life we can systematically achieve if we're really 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 willing to look look at ourselves and go this is really going to suck this is really going to suck but it's worth it you know as i mentioned to you it's like what a crazy thought like if if you knew me 10 years ago and and i said to you i said my ex-wife and i not only are we not arguing we're friendly you would you would have like you would have fainted, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's like, uh, totally. Yep. Sign me, whatever, whatever I signed up for on this journey, sign me up for it again, because despite, despite the sort of looking myself deeply in the mirror and being unimpressed, right. really, really unimpressed when the world was, you know, outwardly impressed. Yeah. That's the tough one. And what, a, what a, what a sorry piece of shit that sounds like. It's like, Dude, this bag of gold is so heavy. Shut up. And that's what I that's that's what I mean. It's like I had to go take my own advice. Jeff, put your big boy pants on, shut up, yeah. and go, go get it. Just like you you've taught yourself. Yeah. Or you've been taught. Work hard from your family. Work hard at school. Work hard at athletics. Be a good team player. Get back to doing it. So what's the difference then between, I mean, we talked about creativity, but what do you think the difference is between the guys that break and the guys that don't, you know, when you're going through that kind of training and that kind of like, um, do you think it's a, I mean, cause like you said, we all have different backstories that get us to where yep. we are, you know, and it's not like, oh, that all, all these guys that are operators have the similar backstory. It's like, no, that's not true. Yeah. Uh, and we can, we can definitely, uh, you know, confirm that it's definitely not true, but, um, there has to be like a common, like common thread of just not quitting yeah know? and that's a kind of like where like for me um i'm not a navy seal you know but i do other things like i told you like recovering from my back surgery without pain pills and right um it's i do things like that because i want to challenge myself every chance i get like i want to challenge myself mentally right not always physically so physically too but like more it's more mental like because yep. for me that's the part that where most people break yeah and so that's i i think that that's where the, my biggest change has been is that is that you know I've always seen my job as a purely objective thing using might and anger right. and uh, uh, directives and orders. They're very objective. Right. What I, what I, I did not realize the power and the utility of subjective behavior, right? Love and kindness and patience because it, it takes a lot more practice to do that stuff, oh, yeah. but the power of it is, 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 Number one, it's substantially larger in terms of us really getting not only what we want, but what we need, like right. really need, which is why it's so difficult. But also it's not, it's not destructive because what, what's like guys' biggest problems, guys, guys, a lot of guys' biggest problems or my, my biggest problem was I was in a, you know, I was in a profession where there is a certain level of needed and necess necessary aggression, yeah. charisma, uh, you know, things that, that make that make the individual emotionally, uh, physically appealing, at least at surface level. Yeah. Uh, that stereotype. I'm trying to be very precise with my words. Yeah. And I'm not trying to be silly here. So it's just it, it, because I do respect it and. And, and I was it. Like I'm not. I'm not throwing stones. Hmm, but you, it, it, you embody this sort of. You do believe you're capable of doing those things that the, the society says is so impressive because you can. Yeah. But the thing is, is when you've practiced things that much with the mixture of the, 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 the gift, the physical gifts that I've been blessed with, yeah. they're not that difficult, but we start believing that Oh, I, I've got these superhuman capabilities. You're like, no, man, you've practiced that thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And it's not that difficult, not because you're so good, but because you're, 
you enjoy it too. Yeah. You're like, oh yeah, I, I do enjoy this job. <laughs> I'm not just like this, like nobody, I'm telling you. Uh, well, there's probably a couple people that are dreading it, but no Navy SEAL that just gets his trident is like, I don't want to go to the teams. <laughs> I, I don't want to know what that's about. I'm pretty cool here, man. <laughs> like nobody does that. So I'm yeah. saying is like, everyone's excited. Everyone's really excited as they should be. Right. So let's not pretend for a second that we weren't doing that job also because we enjoyed it. Totally. And so I think, I think that that's the double-edged sword too, is we, we look at something and we go, this is violent. This is all these sort of things and I enjoy it. And it kind of disrupts our belief systems a little bit Yeah. for a while. Was it hard when you transitioned out? To like kind of reacclimate yourself back into normal society, I guess, quote unquote normal, whatever that is. If you had asked me that the first year, I would have said, no, no, this is easy. Right. In retrospect, I did not even, I didn't emotionally transition at all. Yeah. I just stopped going into that office, but still I continue to act like it yeah. for man. For, for better part of two years, I still acted like I was, you know, a gatekeeper to that community. And it not only, I lost a lot of friends, understandably, there's a lot of uh, um, heat that I've gotten from the community and the command. And I understand that as well. And, and that's one of those things that's like, you know, if I, if I could pull back that, some of those fishing lures that I threw out and snag some guys, I, I just but you can't. And so for me, it's like my repentance will be, is the best thing I can do is, is let time do what it's going to do, be as truthful as I can be. Uh, and then I, I'm not looking for any introduction. Like I don't, I don't want to be part of the community. I don't want to be back in, but, but it's one of those things. It's like, I, I would, it, I'd spent all those years in the community being a part of something that I did and do respect. And it's kind of like, man, I'm not going to go back in and, and, and fix any unresolved stuff. Right. But, but it's one of those things that inside you're like, I can still do good. I can still do good for this community, but I'm only going to be able to do that if I'm just honest and, and, and I don't talk about stuff that's not relevant. Right. Cause it's like what I think about what the teams of the government or the country is doing from a political standpoint, man, I, yeah, of course I have an opinion potentially, but it's like, I really look at it and go, I have no information to even bases off. I like, well, yeah, but you could watch the news. I'm like, no, 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 let me rephrase that. <laughs> even if I watch all network TV, I still have no information to base my ethical opinion because as far as I'm concerned, yeah, I don't need to bash network TV, but it's not something I choose to consider information. Right. So I, what I choose to do is Look at, hey, how can I impact, like you said, how can we how can we help people? How can we be good? I know what my profession is as an exercise physiologist. I know what my background is as a Navy SEAL and as a former athlete and a dad and all these, not a former dad, I'm still, but it's like, I'm drawing from these sort of things finally. You know, it's like I had this huge mess of a Lego system in my life and I had to disassemble all the Legos yep. and I'm finally rebuilding it and it looks looks good. Like life is steady, life is better, and it's just going to keep getting better because, like, it's just telling now. Now we don't have to make shit up. Now I just tell the story. Totally, man. Totally. What do you see yourself doing? Like, I mean, you have the obviously your your company, um, which is around exercise and and you know things like this. What do you see? What's the big picture game for you? Like, what do you, what is your ultimate goal? Yeah. Like, so here in the thing that one of the things I'm trying to temper a little bit too, is like, I have a big vision in my head, yeah. but what I'm learning is that sometimes that big vision in our head, it, it stifles the now, at least mm -hmm. I'm saying like, I'm looking ahead right, right now I'm looking from now until the first week or two of February, right. because that's going through the holidays as peaceful as I can get a lot of work done. I'm making the move to Colorado. Like I said, so that's my focus. Now that's like, I'm really like the move is where my head is at now in the future, not too far. What I will have for sure is I will have my training facility in Colorado on my residence, just like I do here in Virginia beach, okay. uh, private residence. It'll be much larger in Colorado. There'll be more amenities and those sort of things, but really ultimately just, it's not so much a business as it is 
my own po- personal utopian gym space that I train my clients. That's why I have a lot of clients that come train with me uh, and that won't change. It's just like one of those things like, well, I've never heard of this guy because the, a lot of the clients that I work with, the, they are in the business of not talking right? and they don't want people to know that somebody is providing them special, unique care because that's competition. That's, that's money out of their pocket and food out of their family's mouth. So I have uh, a fair number of special clients that I deal with, but then I have a lot of other clients that what, where my heart is really at is dealing with the law enforcement, fire, military, making sure those men and women are they have the content that best prepares them for a selection course, yeah. uh, for a competition course in the military, like the you know you know the best ranger program or like a swap competition or something, or a difficult, more difficult potentially, uh, special forces selection program like Army Special Forces, MARSOC, uh, Ranger School, Buds, whatever it may be, PJ, Combat Controllers, Rescue Swimmer, for their, you know you name it, it goes on and on, is. Because of my background as an exercise physiologist, plus having an opportunity because of active duty and working with in the human performance department at the command, you get to meet those people. Like I said, I, I met department heads and other programs and units, and and you really get to see how they're running their programs. And, and it's just like, man, I get to sit back and learn how all these experts are training special forces guys all over the world. And I get to take part and help and learn and build programs. And it's like... I learned a ton because I had so many great teachers yeah. and then I'm able to take that, extrapolate that with my own experience as a strength coach in university and then mold it into something that's like, okay, I don't want access to the military on the backside, but if I can take this programming and better prepare them, now these, the professionals that I know and respect that are in the active duty space and the rel, you know, in that military space, those guys, those men and women in the active duty side or in the government system working for active duty, they're receiving better trained, better informed, better educated, younger soldiers. Right. And so that's like, it's like get them in the freshman class. Like I feel like I'm trying to get as many freshmen as I can, so to speak. Yeah. So I can get them into the sophomore class into the military, whatever it may be. And so that's, that's where my heart's at. I really, I really like, it's very fulfilling to me. When, when someone says, Hey, I'm really struggling with getting this better and that better. And you, you give them, you give them some direction and you, some programming and boom, and then they're students yeah. of themselves. Not, not like constantly coming back, like tugging on me, like, give me more, give me more because I've given it out. I'm like, here's, here's the, here's the process. Listen to me, what I've got to say, tweak what we can learn. Let's open your ears. And for me, that's the most fulfilling is is where you can teach something and they actually need less of you, not right. more of you. So you prefer like the on- online kind of a platform or more of like an in-person type platform? Well, like what's your preference? Well, my, what drives me is in person. Right. What the online piece is a necessary piece, giving the context of logistics. Yeah. <laughs> but also, so I'm redoing my website. It'll get launched hopefully sometime in February where it will be far more interactive. So if, if we just take essentially what YouTube and Instagram and those in the bill in like the, I guess not the billboard, but like, yeah, like the, the, you can go on and create a community chat rooms and stuff and answer questions. Yeah. That stuff's all getting built into my website. So it's, it's not, people aren't going, Oh, I got to go to this YouTube channel. Oh, I got to go to his Instagram and Oh crap. He's on Facebook live and Oh crap. He's over here. His website is by his program. no, Everything, all my video, all of my monitoring, all my built, all of all of that chat room is all going to be embedded on the back side of the website with the membership. Nice. And then that way, it's like okay, it, it brings probably it'll bring the white noise down a little bit. It, at first, it's going to be a crazy because everyone's going to be a bunch of questions, and then I got to start answering them and create dialogue. And then when as new people come in, they go, oh, they can just read through dialogue. They're not, we're not having to re that's the thing with social media. It's, it's super powerful and it's awesome. It's just that like you think of the 10 most common questions that any profession might get. Well, if you have a thousand followers, you know, and then the next week, let's say you got 2000, the next a thousand followers are probably going to have by and large, the same 10 most questions and so on 2000 to 5,000 to 25,000 to 60,000. So you, it, you know, if you are a deliverer of information 
or a business, and that's what you see in businesses, it's constantly uploading for as people come in, aren't feeling like they're in second place. Right. Like, why would I keep coming back if every time I come back to jujitsu, we're only we're only working with black belt technique. Right. So, but assimilation, right? When you have a really good working sport system, or you have a really good race team, or you have a really good business model, if you bring somebody in that's competent, qualified, willing, and is able to just sit back, learn, listen, and feel, yeah. and don't they're not expected to take on too much responsibility at one given time, what you do is you're able to assimilate them. They can look and listen and learn really fast. Yeah. But if it's chaos, if there's no direction from the coaches, if the boss is a mess, if people are on time or are, are late, there's no continuity to it. Yeah. So it's just chaos. And so people underestimate formulating that into their life, just going, hey, clean your own house up. It's like what Jordan Peter, Dr. Jordan Peterson says, clean your own house up, house up first. And, and what I take from him is just like these little things like, ah, I got to get this done. I got to get this done. That stuff tends to give us more static than like the big stuff. We, we tend to not even get to the big stuff. Yep. Agreed. Are you going to have like a vetting, um, kind of like a vetting process? And the reason I ask that is because there's communities that I've joined, you know, like whether it be a Facebook community or whatever, where it's like you have, there's always like a couple people in the group, you know, that are just yep. downers. You know, yeah, I'm it's looking like, it's at, like, I'm trying like, to figure out how to figure that out. Yeah, yeah because that, that's tough because you have like, I mean, even like if I go on one of your Instagram lives or I go on Mitch, one of Mitch's Instagram lives, it's like the questions that they get, the haters that come on, and it's just like, Dude, come on. You know, like it's these people have like well, see, here's the upside. a problem for every solution, you know? And it's so, like So and, and this is this is the unfortunate yet fortunate side and necessary side of growth is that for example, on this for the website, if I get if I create a membership page, yeah. it's gonna be a minimum. It's like you can pay up front for the year or you pay guaranteed 12 months. It's, there's no reimbursement. There's no refund at three months. Right. So it's like, you can come on and hate all you want, but I'm going to put a clause on there. If there's a disruption that you have to be corrected to or something, like it's worth thinking through. You can't put clear guidelines that have to be subjectively measured. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I don't know that you could all say, what's three strikes? What validates that? Yeah. Uh, so this is all a point of discussion. This, but again, at the same time, it being a privately owned business and private, like proprietary website, I can say, just like any business, person can be removed from present premises with, with because it's a private business, right? Kind of thing. So, I, 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 I'm not worried about carrying the big stick. I think the carrot itself is big and it's fulfilling. Yeah. So there always are going to be some, but here's the beauty is what I'm trying to do is create the community Yeah. like the, where people can come in. And even if I'm not moderating it, there's other stuff. people are going, oh yeah. And like, Hey man, where do you live? Shoot. I live just down the street from you. There's no community. There's no, Hey, I got 16 guys in San Diego and 12 in New York. And they're all on the same page running my programs. And then they work as a team. It's assimilation. Yeah. It, that's all this is. And that's what buds is. Mm -hmm. It's can you assimilate to a program that's already been proven to work, whatever that means, yeah. right? It's the Patriots organization. It's use any, any like it's Google, it's Apple. It's these, these organizations we go, oh, if you're going to come here, you're going to walk the line. And some go, that's the line worth walking. Right. You know, if you ever yeah. seen that, ever seen the documentary in Ferrari, I have their, their warehouse, their, their manufacturing plant. It, I, th I think it's, I, I really think that this is true. If I remember, it may have changed, but the building itself, it's the largest, how do I say this? Inside the, the, the physical structure of the, of the warehouse of Ferrari, there are more trees inside that building than in any other building in the world. Wow. It's, it, it's like, <laughs> there's all these like walking paths and parks inside the factory and it's all glass oh wow it's amazing so my i guess my point is is like there are some organizations looking at worth looking at going how do they do this but you look at it and go well, yeah we can't be like ferrari no 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 you're missing the point we're not asking you to be like ferrari 
Right. We're asking you to say, look how Ferrari treats its people, how it how its system works. Yeah. Can you glean any from that to to up to upscale or downscale? Yep. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. It's like when you listen to Tony Robbins, people go, "Oh my God, that's overwhelming." It's like, okay, yeah, yeah, he is. But he, but it, but but take his meaning. Yep. You know, it's like. You, Accountability again. Tony Robbins is just an example used because he is so well known. Right, like him or hate him, it's like one thing he is above all else is a is a blessed communicator. Oh, totally, dude. He's a master of NLP for sure. And that's kind of the the thing that I was the reason I was asking that question is because even with like, I mean, I don't even have that many followers on on Instagram, but I'll get messages from people, and it's like they they message me like, oh, how did you get off all your drugs? How did you stop drinking? How did you do this? How did you do that? I just stopped. I got to a place mentally where I was ready to, I was, I would rather, I'd rather die than keep doing what I was doing. And when I got to that place, I knew I was done so that you have people that reach out to you and you try to tell them that you try to articulate what it is that you, what place you were in and how you did what you did, but then they keep giving you more excuses as to why they can't. Right. And so I feel like sometimes like it's taking away from me really connecting with people that want to change or people that are interested in changing. It's like, Okay, cool. Like, I want to devote my time to those people. So like, I feel like when you have a community, sometimes you get people to join those communities that it's just minutia. It's like, dude, you're, yep. you're, you're kind of killing my time here, bud. You know, and like mm -hmm. trying to get to a place where, like you said, you're, you're okay with carrying the big stick, but it's like, you're going to have to 86 those kind of people because it's like they're taking away yep. from other people there that are trying to learn, you know? It's, there's, there's, I kind of, it's like, there's different train stops. Right. Right. There are different emotional train stops. Yeah. Like you are progressing at a pace because of your starting point. We'll say it's like you and I both cold Turkey Our our that's our second stop. Well, that might not be someone's like till their sixth stop. Right. So it's like they're, they're intersecting you like three stops down, down your train link. Right. Cause it's like, they didn't think that they had to look way back. It's like, Oh, because it, that's where ego, it's like, oh, my issue is alcohol. And you get to it and go, oh, shit, it's not alcohol. It's just addiction or whatever it is. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, it's a deep-seated, root, deep-rooted seat problem in this. Yeah. It's like, for me, I'm trying to get back to the origin where the engine's built. Absolutely. Right? That, and, that's, and that's the thing is that, that trip, that long trip, when I finally decided to get off the train, I knew it was like, forgive the metaphor still, but for me, like that's the visual of it. It's like the journey is so long for me to get back to where I feel like I'll be at homeostasis, but that's why it's so overwhelming Yeah, is because we just realize you're not going to get there unless you get the first step back. Yep. It's true. And sometimes like it, it can be overwhelming when you ask people, like people will ask me because all my buddies drink, they all go out and drink and whatever, and I'll go to bars with them and I don't drink. Um, and they're like, oh, isn't that hard for you not to drink? I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's, I guess like it's, uh, yeah, I, I would like to, you know, feel that buzz again. You know, I, I think about it. It's not like it's like out of sight, out of mind type thing, but my life is abundantly better without it. So like, that's what prevents me from even going down that rabbit hole ever again. Um, yeah, I, I think I, that I that's what you're talking about. That mindset is that, you know, I, 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 I attach creativity to it, but on the flip side of it is that I believe that individuals that can do can make that 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 instant break that that physical the emotional break isn't as clean right you, you made the decision oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but it's really that physical manifestation you've just you've controlled the compulsion to reach out and do it so to speak yeah. and, and that's the difference is that i think there are certain people whether it's because of conditioning or whatever don't have any idea why this might be the case or why I might be thinking about this, but you're able to actually somehow constructively put yourself in your future shoes and f just imagine the dismay that you may feel with that regret. Yeah. It, I, I, the regret for me was overwhelming, which, why, which is why it wasn't, I'll be honest, I resented the idea of quitting. I was, not only was I with things in life, and that's my big problem, is like not only am I gonna cut my nose off to spite my face, but I'm, then I'm gonna go to my ears just mm -hmm. to show you how serious I am. Yeah. And I got to that point, I'm like, put 
the fucking sword down. Yeah. You don't need to prove anymore. Yeah. You're not, you're not, a, you're the teacher now. Yep. Totally. The guys that are coming to you, men and women that are coming to you, they really are willing. Appreciate that gesture. Yeah. Give them the information to better equip them. That's that's your that that's that's where you're at in life. Okay. That is honorable. That is a good place to be. It, it's it's not going to be flamboyant. It's not going to be without work. It's mm -hmm. where your homeostasis is at. So that's what I see from now and the next. So that's your very long answer, short question. That's where I see myself for the next year. Yeah. After that, whatever God wants me to do, it, because I really, really am. I'm just I'm along for the ride, man. Yeah. All these amazing people, all these amazing events, all these amazing conversations, all these amazing opportunities that I'm not squandering is leading me to really happy, amazing, beautiful people. And I, I'm not getting off the train. How do you perceive God? What is God to you? God is not in a church of any sort. It's, it's, it's almost, again, insulting to think that we can box up something so infinitely beautiful into a church uh, and, and and pretend to think that and i get like i'm i'm generalizing let me let me back up for a minute i get what you're saying i i, I, I wholeheartedly believe in church and in the, the congregation of people uh for a much greater cause and being for me I, I don't relate to that i grew up catholic well my mother raised me wonderfully with love and patience and kindness which is actually uh, stereotypically contrary to many, many people's belief in the Catholic church. And I understand that where that comes from. And I, I'm not supportive yeah. of that either, you yeah. know, so I don't, don't get me wrong about that. Like this is not about religion, but I just want to give, give a little guidance. Like I am spiritually neutral in terms of what man has boxed around God. Yeah. But what I'm not spiritually neutral about is the, is the direction and impact that is necessary for my life, for others around me, uh, and for my own peace of mind and salvation. And so the next question, and then just to get out, is like, what, where does Jesus fit in all this? He fits in there perfectly as the son of God. It's just an interesting thing that I wasn't there. It's a belief. It's a, it's a, I'm a huge believer in history. I believe there is something to be said about, uh, someone so widely and, and like emotionally documented. I think that whatever his reverence is in this world, it's certainly worth looking at. And, and and that's what I just mean from that. I kind of do mean that from an objective point of view. Yeah, I think his, history is there's many many great lessons that we can pull from the Bible. And uh, but at the end of the day, for me, it's everything is rooted around joy and love and peace and happiness and these sort of things and and appreciation. Now, but understanding that I have a real capacity for anger and violence and evil, like we all do, mm. but that gives me balance finally because I'm so willing to not be angry yeah it's a trip because i uh i'm coming to my own terms with what god is to me right you know i think everyone has their own definition of it um because i grew up in the church you know and it was uh i had an idea of what god was based on what i was being taught but now i guess through recovery and through just exploration and observation like I'm coming to a new understanding, you know, of what God is to me. Cause I think you can't deny the history. The history is definitely there with Jesus, but what was Jesus? And that's kind of, for me, like, was he just a master? Was he a master yeah. of like, of the, of mindset, the master of like, of just truly uh, actualized potential? Like, I, I don't, I don't know what that yeah. all was, but I'm trying to get to a, an understanding of that. And I just started praying again for the first time in years, man, like years, years, years. And it was funny. I was talking to my uncle who's not, I wouldn't say he's the, uh, he's not like a deep guy. I don't really have deep conversations with him or whatever, but he's a, he's really big into AA. It's really not my thing, but that's what yeah. he's into. And that's, I'm totally cool with it. Um, but I was sharing with him some of my frustrations and things that I had going on in my life. Um, and he just said, you know, you, you need to give those issues to God, man. You need to, you need to give it up. You're shouldering all of that. And it's not yours to shoulder anymore. You need to like, let it go. And, um, you know, you mentioned it earlier, you'd be feeling rigid. You know, that's what I felt like. Like mentally I was, I could do anything mentally. Like, oh, I got this mentally, but emotionally I was fucking crumbling. I was just falling apart. And, um, so I hit my knees that night and it felt amazing. And I didn't even know what, like, it's like, I didn't know 
Oh, am I praying to this? I, I don't know. It doesn't mm. matter to me though. Right. It's, it wasn't, it, it was a feeling, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's, that was like the reading this morning. Is that emotional aptitude is the words or the term I would describe when someone says, I, I just don't know how to pray. When am I ready? What's going on? How, what am I listening for? And I say, you needed to develop emotional aptitude before you're willing to listen. That's a tough thing is because like I still struggle with listening. Yeah. However, my emotional aptitude has improved so much. Like my willingness to, to just go ask myself the most awful questions about myself yeah. and answer them. Yeah. Not like, well, yeah, but that guy, no, really, man. Like, okay, you were involved. You have a part in this. Own it. Yeah. And that really – and then practicing it. Like I've I've said things that were – I've historically lied about and go, why did I just say that? I've said that in conversation with people. Like, why did I just exaggerate? It's not 3,000. It's 2,300. It's mm -hmm. like okay, I've had to practice correcting myself. Right. And so that's been the fun part of it. And see, that's why it's like the mastery of weight training. Yeah. It's like a, now it's, I'm trying to master vocabulary with yeah. this because that's the only way I seem to, to me, speaking and talking and communicating is the most readily available way to practice these things. Definitely. I can see you're doing that a lot with your life. You know what I mean? It seems like everything you're doing is very methodical. It's like, I'm going to practice my speech. I'm going to practice the way that you work out. I'm going to practice the way that I eat. I'm going to practice. And like, you're aware of like everything around you. Like you talk about like buying all the stuff from Amazon. It's like, well, what am I doing? Is that part of my addiction? I yeah. Need, I need to look at that. I think that's commendable. So I did. I deleted my Amazon app yesterday because I was like, okay, before I blame it, create, put a little pin, a little bookmark and go, you can't ignore it now. Right. Pay attention to it. Because if you really want something, you either go to the store or you're going to go on your computer until you think, okay. You've got it under control. Especially, it's just not a good, it's just bad practice. I really see you at some point being, I mean, you already are, I think, in, in one way or another without probably even being aware of it, but in the recovery, like movement, you know what I mean? Of getting people, not just addiction as far as drugs, but emotional. You know what I mean? Getting to a place where they're emotionally, like you said, at a homeostasis, where you're comfortable with who you are and what you are and owning it authentically and, and being willing to be vulnerable with your shit and being right. like, I need to take ownership for that. You know what I mean? Like I, you know, like what's, what's your part in that? And you know, I talked about with like, with my divorce, you know, when I went through my divorce, yeah, granted my, it was not the, the woman I wanted to be married to, but I had to own my side of the fence of that whole deal. You know what I mean? Like what, what was my part in all of that? And now I do it with my current wife. It's like, Hey, you know, like when we have a disagreement or whatever, it's like, I need to own it. I need to own what, whatever my insecurities are that I'm putting off onto her, what, whatever triggers that I'm having and I'm putting off onto her. I need to own all of that to be more available to her as a husband and more available to my kids as a father. And it's interesting, man, because I feel like that's part of recovery for me is like getting to a point where I'm the best version of who I can be, you know, reaching my highest potential. Um, I want to ask you uh, a couple questions that I ask everybody that comes on the podcast. First would be if uh, you had one person, one book or whatever that inspired you the most, that inspired you to get to where you are today or where you think you're headed, um, what would that person be or what would that book be that really inspired you the most? I would, I would say the person to this point in my life that is, this is going to be an interesting question because the word inspiration to me um, reminds me of a person. Yeah. To be, be honest with you, it reminds me of my ex, my ex fiance. Oh, well. Um, and I mean that in a, in, in a way that's truly objectively respectful, right? but subjectively, I understand her as a person or I did and, and, and she, in her, her heart, it's huge. Right. So it's yeah. someone like that where, and the reason why she inspires me and did inspire me, like she inspired me per, plural or past tense, like, because there is no emotional loving connection with, as far as other than respect for this person. Right. So she was, she is such a thoughtful, uh, a thoughtful communicator. And she, that's why I talk. That's why 
she is kind of who I try to emulate in a sense when I speak because she spoke from such a point of like, get ready, get set, breathe, exhale, go, think, speak, relax, stay calm, say what you mean, mean what you say, don't be hurtful, be conscient. Like, I, 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 I replay so many of the conversations that her and I had where she was clearly in the right all the time trying to mentor me because she cared. Right. And I hear that speech over and over. And, and now, you know, that, man, it tore me apart for years. It did. That's what nearly, you know, my behavior and that like is what was so wrong, wrong about me for so long. But now looking back, I go, I mean, I laugh at it and I chuckle and I go, man, why was I not? Lit? She, she's like my, like I go to a, th- I have ther- see a therapist every week and, and, and Norm and I'm like, shit, Norm, I should have just paid her because yeah. it's the same stuff. That, yeah. it, not really. I mean, contextually, it's like she was intellectually so, so there and I was so not there. And, and I, and now that, I'm living how I am in the moment and appreciating sort of things. I'm like that level of clarity for me, I I just really respect. For sure. That's like my wife. She has two degrees in psychology, right? So (laughs) when we first got together, she has a a degree in clinical psychology and a degree in forensic psychology. And uh, so when we got together, I was like, oh, dude, there's no way I can play any games with this one. Yeah. (laughs) she's She's got me figured out more than I have myself figured out, you know? It's so here and here's just like, here's, here's the thing is like, this dude's talking about his ex-girlfriend, like no wonder why he's single. So here's why. But (laughs) (laughs) so it's, but here's the thing is because of her essential, really like I, I, I attribute this benefit to her now is that because of her is because now I have found not just other women, but other men and young, like now I've found an entire variety of people with that same sort of emotional maturity, yeah. like from ages 25, 26, 35, like men, women, like just from uh, all different backgrounds and lifestyles. I'm like, oh, like well, people, a lot of people are, they want to communicate. That's, that's, I guess the, the summary is that it, she, she has shown me that there are a lot of people like her if I'm willing to invest a little bit of care into them and then they can open up and then I can go, that's beautiful. I respect that. I appreciate that. I would fight and defend for you. And then that person reciprocates because you are open and emotionally open to them. And it's not from a point of well, what am I going to get out of this? Yeah. It's from a standpoint of this just feels good to be good. Totally. Is she off the table? Is it like, is it something that you Yeah, can, no, and it, and, and, and it is. And that, and that's, and that's okay. Like it's, 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 this isn't about like this, this is just painting a background, the sense of like, yeah. I, I, I believe in my heart truly that that's like the one thing is like, if you, if you can, if, if two adults, male and female can break up, and when they leave that breakup, big hug, appreciate each other, and they move on, it's like that to me isn't like it's not a fairy tale. The reason why it's not a fairy tale is because I've been able to achieve that in some degrees with friends. I've tried relationships where both have been, hey, it's, it's just not going to work. It's just we want we're di- like we're just so openly communicating as we go. You get like three weeks in where it's been it's been good, it's been free, but you kind of look at each other and go. Yeah, it's not gonna work. But you're pretty awesome, man. Like this is cool, but like I'm not feeling it. And she's I'm not feeling it. I go, huh? Okay. Cool. <laughs> like, no harm, no foul. Like, yeah, it's cool. Like we're adults. Boom, thumbs up, we go. Yeah. And, and I'm going, huh. <laughs> like it sucks. Don't be wrong. You walk like I the girl I was seeing most recently a couple weeks ago, you know, uh, I guess a couple weeks ago, it, friends still. Like I, she came over and I was like, Hey, this is what's going on. Here's the truth. Here's how I feel. Like immensely respectful and like a couple couple days late and so she came back over uh we just sat and caught up and just chat and then she went home it's like you build friendships with people for real and then you go oh it's transparent to color to relate race religion gender yeah just good people then totally 
I think a lot of people get stuck in the whole like guys can't be friends with girls type deal. You know what I mean? It's doubt. Like, yeah. And that's step four. It's tough. Challenging, you know? Yeah. But, but it's I, primal. You know, you're thinking like on a primal level, you're like, dude, like obviously you want to procreate and you want to, you know, yeah. you want to be a dude. Well, and see, so. here's the, here's the effed up thing too, is, you know, it's like when you're in a good headspace, you attract when you're in a bad headspace, you attract a certain crowd too. Definitely. But when you're in a good headspace, you start attracting all the stuff. You're like, oh my God, like friendly people start showing up and they're like, are they friendly? Cause like, and then you're like, oh, okay. Now I can get to know people. Cause they're like, they recognize me as friendly right. and now everyone's friendly and they're not going, what's up with the tattoos and the beard and stuff. They're just like, Hey, yeah. so it, it's, it, that's been a big in a rush for me because I've always been pretty introverted. And now I'm in a social situation where I don't feel the anxiety that I used to because I'm like, well, if I'm uncomfortable, I'll just leave. But I don't need to be uncomfortable because I'll find somebody here I can chat with. Right. So the next uh, next question is, um, if you had one thing in your life that you could do over, that you could do differently, and I guess I'll use, uh, because I have sons and I know you have one, I'll use your son. If there's If there's something that you could teach your son, like say, hey, son, like, don't do it this way. Do it this way because it'll save you a lot of heartache. What would that lesson be, and why? That it, it, we that's what this whole podcast is about. Is the lesson clearly is going to be communication? Yeah. Is now basically what I would be teaching my son is basically reteaching myself. Oh, Honestly, yeah. it's like okay, what would I do differently with my son? Many things, but one of them would be. You know, for example, a simple one, but it manifests itself in a much greater scale. It's like a couple, couple months ago, I was like, Mason, fill the dishwasher. I go, I leave the kitchen. I come back. I just take a look at it because I was going to put something in there and it's not done the way that I wanted it. Right. But, and I was like, I began to raise my voice like Mason to yell for him. I'm like, dude. And I, I stopped myself for the first time. I'm like, I go, man, I'm 40 years old. You've never taught your son how to load it, what your expectations are for a dishwasher. And so I was like, oh, Mason, come here. And he's like, oh, what did I do? And he had his eyes like, oh, shit, dad's going to yell at me again for what? And I go, I've never taught you how to do this, has I, have I? And he looks at me like, no. And I go, okay. I open it up and I go, this is what I expect it to look like. So do it this time. Now, now it's like, Mason, do the dishwasher. Okay. Yeah. It's like, Oh shit. Yeah. You have to teach them everything to, to your standard. Yep. If you expect that standard to be held, like you can't hold anyone accountable. If you don't give them the information that you expect to be executed. Yep. So for me, that is so exponentially valuable for a child yep. for raising a puppy. <laughs> right. Yep. Like, it's just like, Oh, what does that mean? consistency of all the stuff you don't want to do. It's so crazy, man. So many good takeaways from this podcast, man. Like, cause I'm thinking I'm, I'm going in my own head. Obviously as you're talking, I'm like, it's so funny, you know, cause I have a 12 year old son and you know, I have a, a four year old and a two year old and a newborn. And it's like, but with a 12 year old, um, I hold them to a certain standard, but it's like, sometimes that standard is in my own head. It's never yeah. communicated what my, what I actually, I, I haven't taught him how I want him to make his bed. Yeah. I haven't. So we did that. To, we did that last night or two <laughs> nights ago. I right. go, this is how you make a bed. Right. Yep. Okay. And then I get all pissed off and I'm like, Hey man, you didn't make your, your damn bed. And it's like, what an asshole, man. Like I need to reevaluate kind of like where, what I'm doing with him. You know, and that's, and that's the tough thing is cause what does it do? It, it question, it, it puts your, it puts your belief systems in question because you're like, well, my dad never explained to me. <laughs> oh, but shit, my dad and I never got along. Right. Yep. And my wife tells me all the time. It's funny because she'll tell me, she's like, honey, you need to stop expecting your son to be like you were. Oh. You had a completely different life. And then you're like, it's I'm not the same thing. And well, you're, you're like, why am I trying to condition my son to be somebody that I don't want him to be? Right. That's what we start doing. That's like Jordan Peterson says, don't let your children do something that makes you mad at them. That's exactly what he's saying. Right. It's like, I got mad at him for not doing the dishwasher correctly. Yeah. Well, I never taught him. <laughs> Who the f, f do you think is supposed to teach him? Right. <laughs> Me. Yeah, so it's like, 
old Jeff would have been like, screw it. My dad didn't teach me because my dad didn't. Yeah. But that's but that's to say, well, my dad's a bad dad. No, his dad never taught him how to load a dishwasher because they didn't have a dishwasher. Right. A dishwasher was a luxury in our house that we, my mom and we used, but it's like, that was the expectation. Yeah. There was no, uh, uh, no, you're going to do the dishes. Yeah. Your mom's not, you are. So yeah. it's, we are a byproduct of our upbringing. And so then we, because it be, some of us begins it begin to resent yeah. when we got to go, okay, it's me. Yep. Totally. I mean, it's funny because you look at, like, I look at the way that I've, I've coached and fathered my son and it's like, wow, I've held him to my standard over the things that I've learned over the course of the 37 years that I've been here on, on earth. And I expect them at 12 to understand all that shit. <laughs> right. Like, and what, what, a, what a crazy thing. It's like, yeah. you're 18, go, go have a career. And like, you haven't let me even have an imagination. Cause I went from kindergarten, stand in line, shut up. Don't touch here. Stand in this line. Don't touch the wall. You, why'd you piss yourself your entire life from kindergarten to the 18 year old? You've been standing in line like a fucking prisoner going, mm -hmm. do this pee here. Don't be late. Why didn't you do this? Your grades aren't good enough. And you get out in the real world and go, why don't you have a credit card? Why don't you have a checkbook? Why don't you have a degree? Like, I haven't even been let to know what I'm supposed to do yet. I've been told my entire life what curriculum I have to learn. Right. And now I'm, I'm expected to go out and be something. <laughs> I don't even know what I should be because I've been told my whole life that I'm going to be doing nothing or like you're going to amount to nothing. And like, I'm not interested in the stuff that school provides. I want to be. So we, we, we box our kids in. Totally. Guilty. Like we do, yeah, it, it, but it's just like, Okay, so what I'm trying to do is my advice is like I'm trying to maintain a supportive outlook on what the parochial school system is providing for my son, which is good here in Virginia Beach. The school systems are private. The public school systems are, my, are good here. So it's like, okay, that's kind of the kind of giving my son a little bit of guidance, but it's not giving him direction. Dad and mom are for direction. Right. It's like we make sure his compass is good. So he doesn't get off course in school is, is, you know, it's like, is he learning? Okay. Why is he not learning? It's not like, well, the school's not doing what they're, no, 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 no. It comes to me. Yep. And so that's the thing with parents. I go, it's like, if you want your kids, like, here's the thing folks. It, it, and this is me not trying to be condescending. It's like, if you want your kids to not be a piece of shit, be there, pay attention and actually love them. Right. Yep. But, but that's second. If you want your kids to not be a piece of shit, love your spouse. Yeah. That, all right. So actually that's kind of, that's kind of second, <laughs> right? If you really, really give a damn about your family and the structure, find some spirituality and find, find a way to love the God that you perceive that, that talks to you. I don't care who or what it looks like in your mind, as long as it's love. You know what I mean? So it, it's an interesting thing. Cause, but you know, on this physical realm of this planet or whatever on earth, you know, it's, it's really pretty easy in on paper. Marriage is never going to be simple. Spending a lifetime with another spouse with different, just changing lives as we go is, is, a, is a difficult task to undertake, but it's the one way that we know that we can drive our children to the madhouse or to, or to a place of real emotional peace and stability. And it's in the context of how you treat your spouse. Yeah. 100% like, spouse right after God before children. Yeah. It, it, it's, it is the structure. And I thought it was, I thought it was kids before. I always did too. That's something that my wife's taught me actually, is that I thought that when we first got together, I had my son already and it was like, he always came first. Yeah, I, same, first I, did. I was like, Oh no, because you could leave at any moment and he's still here. He's the constant in my life. And I was, I had some insecurities and I was like, uh, security was a big thing for me. So it was like, you're just going to leave me like everyone else. And I just don't, you know, so I was putting my shit onto her, but she taught me that. No, 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 no. I'm, yeah. I'm first. And the kids are after that. You know, yep. if, our, if our foundation is solid, then the other stuff is good to go. And that's, that's definitely been a learn for me for sure. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a tough one to, to make sense of it. But then you realize that that's the difference between protecting your kid and making him, him or her, uh, tough, like appropriately toughening them. Like that's like, like making them, no, not toughen, making them more resilient. So it's like, if I'm going to put all of my love into my child, I'm going to protect them and smother them. Yeah. But if it's like, no, 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 I'm here for you always, but I'm going to put all of my love 
right now to show you what love looks like into my spouse. And now the child looks at it and goes, that's healthy. I want to be a part of it. And also you're exuding health back into your child. It, when you, when you love the spouse first, loving the child, isn't something you're like, well, I got to put him second. No, no, no. You just do that. It it manifests it into that, I believe. So it, it, it's it's a big conundrum because especially for us that we're kind of single fathers and then we we start to try we begin to take on new relationships. It's like I felt the same way. I, I just I I I failed miserably putting myself into her shoes because I thought that I could never understand how she couldn't understand me. Right. That's weird, but it's deep. I know. Yeah. It's like I resented her for that. Yeah. It's like, how could you resent somebody for something that you not only didn't, couldn't ex- uh, experience, right. but you're placing upon her an emotion that she can never emotionally escape from because you've just, that's like, that's the anchor she'll never be able to get away from. Right. It's freaking deep, man. I, <laughs> It's funny because I it was a learn for me big time. It still is, you know what I mean. Where I'm, uh, I think I'm on a good track right now with my wife, which is totally awesome, and we're in a good space. But I had to learn that because yeah. if I didn't, she was gonna be out the door. You know what I mean, because it, it was a matter of time. And she she like, deserves to g- seek happiness elsewhere. If you're absolutely. a big stick in the mud, heck yeah, absolutely. I totally, totally, hundred percent agree with you, man. But hey, man, I, I sincerely appreciate you coming on the podcast. I'm super glad that we got a chance to meet in person for sure. You know, we could have done this, you know, on the phone, but it's it's not the same. Um, and I think, you know, you have a friend for life with me, man. If there's everything I can do for you, always, you know, please reach out to me. You know, if you're ever in California, you know, for sure. Yeah, no, I'm, I, 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 uh, as you're aware of, it's like, I, I, I'm been, and will probably continue to frequent at least San Diego for man. I, I have, I'll be honest with you. My, my reconnection to that city has been such a pleasant surprise. Yeah. Like I, like I said to you, I used to hate San Diego it, emotionally. It, it it exposed me. I felt so vulnerable there. Yeah. And now I just feel emotionally mature. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's good to go. I love San Diego. If there's a, where's a, um, where can people find you? What's the best way for people to connect with you? The best price to find me currently is on Instagram, Jeff CS. CS. Uh, I don't have a Facebook page. My YouTube channel is downsizing because I'm transferring everything to a website. I have a website. It's performancefirstus.com. It will remain looking and being what it is for at least till February. And then there'll be some changes I mentioned. But uh, again, I I am uh, pretty easily to find in the social media world. Being responsive, that's 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 the that's the question mark. No, I mean when you have like a, a shit ton of followers, it's kinda of hard it, to keep up it's, with it. And know? that's why the shift to the website, because I like I said, trying to create a community that people can be a part of. Yeah. Uh and uh in some way make it a little bit of their own, you know, and I I think that's through sharing of information. Absolutely, man. Well, thank you so much, man. I really, I had a lot of good takeaways from this conversation. I'm sure a lot of the listeners will as well. So thanks again, man. You bet. All right, brother. Thank you for listening to My Backstory. Stay motivated and stay connected off the show. Follow at my underscore backstory underscore to be a part of the journey to recovery and to see where your story goes. Or visit us online at hereismybackstory.com.